Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Three-part series, PowerShell for Audit, Compliance, and Security Automation and Visualization, Part 2, Audit and Compliance Data Acquisition with PowerShell. Um, I have put Part 1, if you'd like to watch it in our archive, in the chat window, and now sending the link for next week's Part 3 at 10.30 a.m., January 21st. <laughs> My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Clay Reisenhoover, SANS Principal Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Clay. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, welcome everyone to part two of this three-part series of using PowerShell for doing audit and compliance and security visualization work. So last week was all about just what PowerShell is. This week, I want to show you how we can actually acquire data using PowerShell. And then next week, we're going to spend some time talking about how to visualize that data using uh, dashboard software. We're going to use Grafana next week. Actually, we're going to use Grafana a little bit this week as well. And some other options that you might not have thought about, like automating Microsoft Excel pivot tables and pivot charts that can be, well, really handy when you get called into a meeting and asked to, uh, to make some quick recommendations. So let's start the, the real content for the day. I will introduce myself briefly again. My name is Clay Reisenhoover. I'm an accountant and an auditor, and I used to be a software developer, and I used to be a network guy, but these days I'm a consultant and an IT auditor and a SANS principal instructor and course author. So I'm author of the Audit 507 course, and the upcoming SEC 557 course. And most of the material from these webinars is drawn directly from that SEC 557 material. Um, I'm the guy standing on the right on the picture here. You may recognize the, the one on the left. We make the occasional pilgrimage to Santa Rosa, California, so that we can visit all of the Peanuts characters. So I'd like you guys to take just a minute right now to tell me a little bit about yourselves. I'd like to know what sorts of people um, I have in these webcasts. So Carol, if you will put up the first poll of the day, I would like everyone to let me know what is your job role? I found last week that we had a lot of people who just labeled themselves as InfoSec. We'll see if those results really change any this week. We'll, we'll leave most of these polls up for about 30 seconds to give you time to respond. Wow, and the bell curve I think is even slightly flatter than it was last week with uh, the large majority of you saying that you were InfoSec and then actually a, a pretty good little group who says that they're in IT operations or management. And a lot of what we look at today is going to be helpful for, uh, for all of those groups. Now, SEC 557 is part of the management curriculum at SANS. And I, I find that that really makes sense because uh, part of the, the gap that we're trying to bridge with SEC 557 is measuring whether we're doing things the way that management wants us to do, even in a highly agile, DevOps, high velocity kind of world. In fact, I think of SEC 557 as the class that teaches compliance people to live off the land and to use the tools that their engineers are likely already using. Now, we're also part of the cloud curriculum because we spend about a third of the class on how to take compliance measurements in cloud environments as well. So just to remind you, this is part two 
of a three-part series. So last week, we really just talked about what PowerShell is. I've got a couple of uh, remaining questions from students from last week that I'll cover before we get into the demos for today. But today is really all about how do I acquire data with PowerShell? And we're really gonna look at that uh, four different ways today. I'm gonna talk to you about pulling information from Windows systems, also from Active Directory. We're gonna take a look at some VMware infrastructure and then we're also going to look at the results from uh, a few Nessus vulnerability scans. And we're gonna try to extract data from all of those today that might be useful to us in our audit or our security or our compliance work. Now, next week, we'll look at the third part of the Elvis technique. So today, we're really gonna focus on extracting data. But next week, we'll look at how do we load that data into a uh, time series database, and then how do we visualize that data using a dashboarding tool like Grafana? The agenda for today is, well, I'm gonna follow up a little bit from webcast one. We had a number of questions that we didn't quite have time to answer less, uh, last time, so I'm gonna pick a few of those and answer them for you today. We're gonna really focus on the extract portion of Elvis today extracting data from the different technologies that I talked to you about. There are demo scripts available for the, uh, for, well, the scripts that I'm using for my demos today are available for you to download. I think that's the easy way for me to say that. So Carol is going to uh, paste in a link to this zip file for you to make it a little bit easier for you to get your hands on this. It's, I think, about a three megabyte zip file. And it has all of the PowerShell scripts that I'm going to run during the demos today. Now, this does lead me to my second poll question for the day as well. And that is, I would like to know what your experience is with PowerShell. So have you used it before? Are you comfortable with it? Do you stay up late at night and tell PowerShell all of your secrets? Or are you maybe somewhere in between there? So if you'll take, again, just a few seconds to answer this poll for me. And this is the sort of bell curve that I often see for this class. I think we actually went up 1% on uh, best friend and soulmate as an answer, but a little bit over half of you are saying, well, I've, I've run a few scripts, I've run a few commands, but PowerShell is not really something that I use regularly. So part of what we hope to get out of these webcasts is that you Get a little bit more familiar with how PowerShell works so that as you do your own research into tools and techniques that you might want to use, maybe it's a little bit less intimidating to you. So I mentioned that we had a few questions left over from last week, and I picked three of them here that I would like to cover with you quickly before we get into the demos for the day. Uh, one was, can you use PowerShell in non-Windows environments? And the answer is a definitive yes using what's known as PowerShell Core, which is actually the current developed version of PowerShell. So PowerShell Core uh, version 7.2 is coming out right now. 7.1 is in production. It is cross-platform. And by cross-platform, I mean it will run on Windows, it will run on Mac OS, and it will run on a number of different Linuxes. So if you're using any of those OSs in your environment, then absolutely PowerShell Core is going to be cross-platform across any of those. Now we did a, a brief look at patches last week, and in fact, we'll revisit a little bit of that today when we look at uh, things that we can gather from Windows systems. And I had a student ask a question about, well, how do you get patch information from all of your servers? So there are really kind of two parts to the answer for that. The first is you need permission with whatever user you're using to run the PowerShell commands to remotely connect to those systems and run commands. You do not actually need to be an administrator to query hotfixes. But for some of the things that you query, you will actually need local administrator access to the systems. 
So PowerShell has a loop called the for each loop that will let you run through a, an array or a collection of objects. I might do something like run an Active Directory query listing all servers in a particular organizational unit, and I could then pipe that through a for each loop doing a get hotfix against every single one of those servers and gathering the data locally. In fact, I do that at some of my client organizations. We have daily scripts that reach out and connect to a couple of hundred servers and download this sort of information into a local file that we can then ingest into um, our dashboard. And then I mentioned yesterday or uh, last week that PowerShell is largely case insensitive. You can mix and match case in your variable names, and if you change it next time, PowerShell really won't care. So someone asked, well, what commands are case sensitive? Those are mostly going to be the comparison operators. So there's an operator in PowerShell called like that lets you do wildcard matching with strings. Well, by default, like is case insensitive but there is a case sensitive version of it just called C-like. That, that would be the case sensitive version. It turns out there's also another version of like called I-like, which is the explicitly case insensitive version. So I know it's a little confusing. I've got three different operators with very similar names. What you need to know is that for most PowerShell operators, the default name for the operator will be case insensitive. And if you stick a C in front of that, you're gonna make it case sensitive, which would make it work a little more similarly to how some of your Unix tools work. But I'm ready to get to the demos with you. So like last time, we're not gonna really look at slides today. We're gonna to just run some PowerShell and see how we would be able to use it in our environments. So we're gonna start by looking at some measurements that we could take of Windows hosts, and then we'll move from there into Active Directory, and then those other technologies that I talked to you about earlier. Hi Clay, it's Carol, sorry to interrupt you, but I have a question that might be important to answer now. Uh, the person asks, as I load your scripts into PS in PowerShell, they execute right through. How do you stop the execution step by step like in your demo? He said, uh, or, sorry, but not familiar with, uh, not familiar at all with PowerShell. That is absolutely okay. Let me show you what we do there. So, sorry, I think I'm in Unix sometimes. Let me do this the PowerShell way. I actually have a script that I use to run the scripts a little bit at a time. And that script is called start demo. I didn't write it. I completely, um, you know, just absconded with this. Um, actually, when I saw a man named Doug Fink doing a demo for a module that he has built called import Excel, we're actually gonna look at that one next week. So the start demo script here actually allows me to run step by step through a different PowerShell script. So let me just show you how you would use that. I'm going to run start demo against the first script that I would like to show you all today, which is called 04measurements.ps1. That will load my script and allow me to run things one line at a time by using the enter key. But if I hit question mark here, start demo will actually give me a list of the letters that I can use to control the way that it works. So I normally just hit enter to let it run through a command at a time, but I can do things like hit the T character and it will let me know what time it is and how many seconds I've been in the demo. I can clear the screen. I can change the line number that I'm on. So it's actually a very handy script to use if you do this sort of presentation. Um, alternatively, just load my scripts into an editor and kind of look at them one line at a time as I am running through these things. Now let's see, I just made a note to myself that I really should pay attention to, and that is that I need to be running these commands in an elevated privilege terminal. So I'm gonna take a look at this and just make sure that I am running as administrator, and I'm pretty sure that I am, so I think it's okay for me to move on with this demo here. 
Let's talk about the registry first. A lot of times when you're looking for security settings on a Windows system, you're going to be looking at things that get written into the registry. If you think about Active Directory group policy objects, those usually are really just making registry changes, either to your HKLM or your HKCU registry hives. PowerShell has an interesting way of dealing with the registry, and that is that it treats the registry like a disk drive. I'm going to run the command here, get ps drive, to take a look at all of the PowerShell drives on my system. And you see the usual suspects. I have a C drive on this system, and it has a temp directory on it that's available to me. I've even got some interesting things like a drive for all of the PowerShell aliases on the system, and one that's used for Windows Remote Management. But if you take a look right in here, I've got a couple of drives called HKCU and HKLM that are actually the current user and local machine hives of my registry. We'll often find that security settings are inside those hives. So an example might be something like this. I would like to look at the local security administrator subsystem settings in my registry. Well, I can treat that just like it's a drive location and say, show me the item properties that exist in this particular registry key. And you'll see a lot of things in here that you might find mentioned in something like a CIS benchmark or a STIG standard for an operating system, like that we should probably limit blank password use, make sure that our users can't choose blank passwords, and don't save the old Windows landman style hashes. So I can actually integrate into my scripts some queries for the sorts of settings that I'm interested in for compliance on my systems. If I want to grab an individual value, I can run get item property, wrap it in parentheses, which remember from last week tells PowerShell, I want to treat this result like it's an object, and then I can just pull a property out of that object like limit blank password use. This should give me back a value of one to let me know that limit blank password use has been turned on. So I could do that for each of the settings I'm interested in. I could look at the no LM hash. I could look at whether we're restricting anonymous access to the system. And that actually looks like something that might be a failure for me on a compliance checking script. Normally we would see restrict anonymous set to one, unless there's some reason that it might break some of our existing software. So what I often do in my data gathering scripts is gather the registry key that I'm interested in into a variable. So here I've just created a variable called dollar sign res for result and ask it to pull in all of the settings from that particular registry key. Then I can hey, reference hey, the properties. Hey, I'm sorry, it's Carol again. Um, I have a couple of questions in here. Uh, I'm going to start at the last one. It says, the last line of the screen is only half visible. Are they saying, I, I think what they're saying, okay. Let's just right. do that then. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, please, Daniel, let me know if that's not what you meant. Okay, he said better. Okay, and then okay. someone else says, I can't access the WC2 zip file, getting a connection error when trying to go to the URL. Okay, so let's see what's happened here. Thanks, Clay. Sorry for all the interruptions. Absolutely not a problem. Hmm. Seems to load okay for me from here. I wonder if we might have just a little bit of a throttling issue with the hosting company. Um, let's see. That one is, it's small enough. If you would like to get it from me after the webcast, you certainly, well, how are we going to get that information though? I'll think through that. <laughs> so I'll try to come up with another way that we can distribute this. You may just want to try the URL a couple more times as we're working through the webcast. And if I need to find yes, an alternative place to host it, I will absolutely do that. And I am getting some, a lot of feedback from people. A lot of people say loaded fine for me. I was able to pull it. I got it. Um, it's someone else says it is a newly observed domain, so it is likely getting blocked. Um, some yeah, of those that one got you. So quite a, I'll send you all this, all this uh, from the questions window at the end of the webcast, and you can take a look at it and see if there's anything more you can do. Thanks, Clay. Okay. 
Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, the joy of teaching in the COVID era. We've been dealing with stuff like this all year. Okay, so I think the screen should be more visible now. We were talking about I could grab these results into a variable and I could then query out the individual values. So let me find my screen again. And this would really be useful in doing something like building a compliance testing script. So look at the line of code that I've got here. If my results not limit blank password use is equal to one, and if no LM hash is equal to one, then I could say, okay, you, you passed that particular test. But I find this kind of scripting to become a little bit cumbersome. Imagine trying to write a script to test all of the settings from something like the CIS benchmark. You're gonna write a lot of if commands and it, it can be really difficult to really keep up with that. So there's another tool that's really handy for this. It's called Pester. Pester is a unit testing framework for PowerShell. Now, I know a lot of you aren't developers, so you've not maybe done unit testing yourself, but this is something that your developers would actually be uh, pretty used to seeing. And I actually did a blog post on Pester, I think just a couple of days ago is when we posted it. So if you're interested in that, you can go to sans.org slash blog. Last time I checked, I was still at the top of the list because I was the last one who posted anything. I'm actually, my blog show up down in the management section. So if you look at the very bottom of the list, management doesn't really get top billing on the SANS blog. If you check that management, security, legal, and audit section, then you should be able to find my blog post about Pester. If you're going to be using PowerShell to just test compliance, Pester is probably the tool that you need to learn to do that. But back to doing it the hard way here, I've got my if statement. If both of these settings are correct, then I should see pass on my screen. And in this case, yes, it does in fact look like I've got this Windows system properly configured. Now, certificates are also treated as if they were a drive in Windows. So that local certificate store where you've got things like your trusted root certificate authorities, those are saved as a drive as well. It's called the cert drive. And here I'm just going to jump right in to the cert store for my local machine and the authorized root certificate authorities. And if I wanted to get a list of every certificate authority that I trust, Maybe my organization has stood up an Active Directory CA, and we want to make sure that the, the GPO that pushes trust for that CA is properly functioning on all of our servers and workstations. We could take a look at those installed certificates and make sure that our certificate is one of the ones that exists in there. Now, it's really nice because we've got this SHA-256 thumbprint available to us so we can search for particular certificates and pretty easily verify if they exist in the environment or not. A lot of times as an auditor, I end up having to look at local security policy. Maybe we're testing that GPOs have gotten applied the way that they're supposed to be applied in Active Directory. Or maybe we've got a standalone system that we actually use local security policy for and we need to make sure that the settings on that are correct. Well, unfortunately, local security policy doesn't entirely show up in the registry. There are a few things like user rights assignments that just aren't saved in the registry anywhere. In fact, they get loaded into LSAS, the local security administrator subsystem at runtime, and the settings really kind of exist in memory when Windows is running. But there's a, a really old tool that's been around in Windows for a long time called, well, SecEdit is the name of the executable. Security configuration and analysis is the long name. And I have found that I can still use this old SecEdit tool to help me get the information that I need about how local policies are being applied on a system. So I'm going to run SecEdit here and ask it to export the local security policy to a file called localsecpol.txt. And SecEdit lets me know that it has exported correctly. So I'd like to just take a look at what exists inside that file. 
And you can see it really is just a dump of my local security policy. So if I were interested in something like maybe password aging, what are the minimum and maximum password ages for the system? Or do we allow uh, saving uh, clear text passwords? Or what, what users on the system have the debug privilege? All of that's now going to be available to me in this file. So then I can simply query the file for the sorts of settings that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna use the select string command to do that here. If you're a Unix or a, a Mac OS person, think grep when I say select string. This is going to be something that allows me to search for regular expressions in a stream of text. I'm gonna to try to pull out just that line about minimum password age here to make it easy for me to do my compliance check. And I can see that minimum password age on this system is actually set to zero. That's not going to be compliant with most of the security frameworks that I've worked with, at least, where we don't want the user to be able to change their password multiple times on the same day so they can just rotate back to that password that they really, really like to use. Last week, I mentioned hot fixes to you as another thing that I'm interested in as I'm checking compliance on systems. So let's just remind ourselves of what we talked about there. That get hot fix command will give me a list of all of the operating system patches that have been installed on a particular Windows host. I can learn a lot about the, the way that you're managing your systems just by running get hot fix as an auditor. So I can see here really, it looks like you patched the system back in May of 2020, and then, oh, I guess you heard the auditor was coming, and about a week ago, you did a little bit more patching, and that's really all that I see on this system. In fact, we introduced a couple of concepts last week that I use in some of my compliance work. One of them is patching velocity. How often are we applying patches to a system? So to grab that patching velocity, I'm just gonna group these hotfixes by the date on which they were installed. And I can see that it looks like we had four hotfixes installed about a week ago, and then we had two installed back in the middle of last year, and well, that really seems to be it. I can also look at what I call patch age. Now, this isn't a perfect measurement, and I know that it's not, but it is something that I think can sometimes help management to reduce uncertainty about the environment a little bit. So I think it is valuable. Patch age is the concept of just how many days has it been since we patched the system. Most operating systems release patches pretty frequently. And if you've got a 30 day patching window, then on average, all of your systems should have been patched within about the last 30 days. So I'm gonna grab here the date that the last patch was installed just by sorting my patches by installed on date and then plucking out the most recent one. And I could then calculate how many days has it been since a patch was installed on this system. And on this system, hey, at least within the last week and a half or so, they have done some patching. Now, for extra credit, the thing to do here is to measure this over time and to visualize it for management. That would really give us the ability to see if we're staying compliant over time. Ultimately, I'm gonna use something like my vulnerability scanner to help me take better measurements, not just of, well, when was the last time we patched, but what vulnerabilities do we have? But as an interim step, this could be really useful to, uh, to my administrators and to my management. Now, I mentioned that I would show you how queries can be run against remote systems. So let me type in a password here. And I'm gonna show you that get hotfix has a computer name parameter. I can plug in an IP address or a server name here. I don't happen to be joined up through the domain that this other system is on, and so I'm also gonna pass a set of credentials along with this, and that will query that remote system to see what patches are installed on it. So this is the domain controller we're gonna use a little bit later on in the day, and you can see that it doesn't appear to be super well and currently patched either. It looks like the admins installed a couple of patches probably on the day the server was built, 
and they don't seem to have gotten around to, a, to patching this one again. So that computer name parameter is the final answer to the question that we had earlier in the day. How do I do this against a remote system? A lot of my PowerShell commands allow me to run against a remote system using a parameter like computer name. Another thing that you might want to measure for, in fact, let's just say that you've decided to implement the CIS critical security controls, and you've gotten to control two, which says that you need to maintain a software inventory, and that you need to have approved versions for all of the software installed on your systems. PowerShell does give us a way to get at that in Windows, but there's no good native command for this. So instead, I'm going to use something called get sim instance. This uses Windows management instrumentation and the, um, the sim standard to allow me to query WMI. So I'm gonna look here for the not very intuitively named win32 underscore product sim information. This actually has information about everything that got installed as part of an MSI installer. This is similar to what you would see if you looked in, well, your add or remove programs control panel, but it's not perfect. This really only shows me software that was installed using the Microsoft installer. In fact, I know that this system has Firefox installed on it. I can go to the bottom of my screen and I can see Firefox is running and yet Mozilla Firefox does not show up in my software inventory that I've taken this way. So there is a slightly more complicated technique that you can use to figure out what uh, software is installed. And I'll run you through that here in, well, just a second. Remember that I've got that get member commandlet that allows me to take a look at the properties that are available when I do a query. And I can see that for my software, I've got properties like the name of the software and its version. Those could be really useful to me if I really was doing a critical control to implementation. So I'm gonna use the format list command here to pull out just the name and the version and the date that it was installed. This now I can compare against my standards. Let's say that we have PuTTY installed on all of our systems and our standard requires that it be 0.74. I can easily check that to make sure that that matches what I've got installed on all of my systems. But remember what I told you, I've got Firefox on this system and if I do a query looking for Firefox, I'm gonna get zero results back. So I've given you another script in the ill-fated zip file called installedsoftware.ps1. And I'm gonna dump it to the screen here. The script's not going to be really easy to read on the screen, but I just wanna kind of show it to you anyway. Basically what I do is I look through HKey local machine and current user looking for uninstall paths for software. Firefox on this system was installed using a package manager called Chocolatey. And while Chocolatey doesn't use MSI to do its install, it does write an uninstall path. That's going to be the way that I find some of that software that doesn't show up using my more traditional query techniques. So if I run the script this time, I actually get a few extra results, and that's what I'm looking for. We run Firefox extended service release, and we should be on version 68.9 right now. So now I know that this system is running the correct version of my web browser. Now, the next thing for us to talk about here, and that's a horrible comment that I put in there, that's a little bit of Visual Studio um, autocorrect trying to, to help me out there. The next thing for us to talk about is Active Directory. That error is normal because I'm not joined up to the domain here, but I can actually get access to Active Directory even if I'm not a member of the domain. I just have to go through a couple of extra steps here. So I'm gonna grab a new credential object with a username and password that's valid for the domain that I wanna query. And then I'm gonna create yet another PowerShell drive. I'm gonna name the drive AD for Active Directory, and I'm gonna point it at a domain controller and give it some credentials. And I will actually end up with a new PowerShell drive called AD that if I 
then go to that drive. If I set my location to my AD drive, I can query Active Directory without being a member of the domain. Now, I'm an outsourced auditor. I come into third-party organizations all the time to do tests. This is a really nice trick that I use to be able to query their Active Directory. And before you ask, because this usually comes up, what kind of permissions do I need to be able to query Active Directory? I just need any account in Active Directory. LDAP is actually quite permissive. If I've got an Active Directory account, I can query for most of the things I need for compliance purposes. So I can take a look inside here. I can see there's information about the domain. This is obviously the domain controller that I use in my Audit 507 labs. In fact, I can really query anything I want to in Active Directory. You can see I can find all 989 uh, users that exist in Active Directory. I can do any query that a member of the domain would be able to do. In fact, if I wanted to take a look at the domain administrators in the environment, I could query for that group and, oh no, my little auditor heart is breaking right now as I see all of these domain administrators coming back in response to that query. This feels like we've got a problem. So if I were in a meeting, I might want to do a fast visualization on this using something known as a .NET grid view. So I'm going to go ahead and let this pop up in a grid view here and just show you. This is kind of nice, and I think I can zoom just a bit. No, it's not going to work well here. But this allows me to very quickly see the results of the query that I just ran in a format that makes it maybe a little bit easier for me to do things like sort by name or sort by the SAM account name of the users that I'm looking at here. So think of this as kind of a tactical visualization that I could use quickly in a meeting just to say, hey, I see about 70 different people here that you've got set up as domain admins. Let's run through the list real quick and see if they all really make sense. Now, on an audit, what I normally do is I run a script. I'm just making sure here that I've cleaned up act, that Active Directory drive. It makes me a little nervous to be connected to someone else's AD. So on an audit, I often run a script that I've written that just grabs that demographic information about the domain for me. And it, again, it's a bit of an ugly script, so I'm not really gonna run you through what it does other than to show you that it creates a custom PowerShell object with a whole bunch of demographic information about the domain. Things like how many users have their accounts disabled and how many haven't used their password in a while. So I'm gonna run that script against my Audit 507 domain and grab that demographic information. How many users are there that are enabled? How many have disabled accounts? How many are there total? Now, these numbers look a little bit weird. I've got 977 users who haven't changed their password recently and haven't logged in recently, but that's because this is a lab sitting on my laptop with no real humans in it, so you kind of run into some of that sort of thing. But if I were in a meeting with management here, I'd say, hey, you guys have 70 domain administrators, and worse, you have 70 schema administrators. That feels a little bit high to me. You know, the next thing that management's gonna do is say, well, tell me who those people are. So we've written this script to not only complain on the screen about how many domain admins you have, but it actually dumps out lists for you as CSVs. So if I were interested in something like the users with non-expiring passwords, then let's just open that up here in open office. I can get a list of everyone who has a user set to not expire. Uh-oh, there's me, the auditor. I probably shouldn't have asked them for a non-expiring password, but man, it sure makes my labs work better. And then I've got a, a half dozen or so server admins with non-expiring passwords. That kind of feels to me like they might have some service accounts out there running as them and that might be really interesting to me as I do my compliance work. Okay, so I need to talk to you all a little bit about time here. I got a little bit behind doing that demo and kind of working with the zip files. So I'm gonna skip the VMware demo for right now. 
which I hate. I would like you guys to really take a look at those scripts if you use VMware in your environment, because you can gather a bunch of information about VMware using PowerShell. But in the time we've got left, I wanna show you something about working with vulnerability scans. So if you all would just indulge me here, I'm gonna go ahead and run my start demo pass, or start demo script again, this time against my Nessus script. And Carol, we're gonna get a reminder here to ask another poll question. So let's do that fourth poll question, the vulnerability scanner poll. This is a problem that I see very frequently with a lot of my clients. And so I wanna kind of get a feel for what has your experience been working with vulnerability scanners? So we should be bringing a poll up for you here very shortly asking you, um, well, how has it gone when you've used your vulnerability scanner? Carol, this is gonna be poll let number four. Sorry, let me get that going for you. That's fine. Okay, so that's the VMware poll. We can go ahead and pull it. And let's do the next poll, poll four. I'm sorry, did you want me to continue with this one? No, I want to do the next poll, the oh, poll my number apologies. four. No problem. I'm I'm changing things on you on the fly. Perfect. That's the poll that I would like everyone to answer for me here. So what kind of experience do you have working with uh, vulnerability scans? Have you been the person that got the 1,500-page PDF emailed to you and someone said, just fix all the stuff that's in here? Worse yet, are you someone like me, the auditor compliance person, who actually drops that 1,500-page PDF on other people? Does your organization not do that anymore and you actually break things into more manageable pieces? Or have you just given up on bone scans because it's a little bit too hard to do? So I'm gonna vote that I have actually dropped that 1500 page PDF on other people. We'll give you just a few more seconds for all of you to answer. Very good, a large percentage of you are actually trying to break things down into slightly more manageable pieces. And 10% of you have just washed your hands of vulnerability scans and you're going away, and then a, a good quarter of you have either have somehow been a part of the problem, either by creating or by receiving these horrific vulnerability scans. So this is actually a problem that I run into pretty frequently. Um, I'll work with an organization that's just beginning to do a vulnerability management program, and they run a bunch of vulnerability scans, and they see the results, and oh my, this is very difficult for me to work with. So that's what I want to kind of end the day with is how can we help the organization through doing some of this kind of work? My administrators installed Nessus. They ran a whole bunch of scans against our public subnets, and they've now got a pile of 80-some-odd CSV exports from those scans. And they've given them to me, and they've called me into a meeting and said, we need you to help us answer a few questions. Basically, how bad is it? How many critical vulnerabilities do we have? What percentage of our vulnerabilities really are critical? And which hosts have the, the most critical vulnerabilities so that we really know where to focus our remediation efforts? So I'm gonna go into the directory that has all of those CSV files and see if we can't do a little quick processing just to grab some fast answers. And then maybe let's look at a longer term solution of tracking vulnerabilities within the organization over time. So I'm gonna import all of these CSV files into a variable called scan results. Now that took just a couple of seconds to run because I do have over 80 scans here. In fact, I've got just over 29,000 findings from this group of Nessus scans. And for those of you that have worked with vulnerability scanners, you know that we get a large number of findings. And in fact, a lot of those are really just 
informational findings that aren't super important to me as a compliance person. So let's take a look at what was available in those CSVs. And if you've worked with Nessus, you'll recognize most of this. Um, the CVE score, or the CVE, the CVSS score, the name of the vulnerability that was found, which host it was on, and a risk rating that's associated with it. And then even some helpful things like other URLs that your admins might want to look at as they're trying to remediate the problem. So think about the questions that we were asked earlier. You know, how many hosts have we scanned here? Well, that's pretty easy. Just grab all the unique hosts out of the CSVs. And that looked like a whole lot of hosts. So it looks like we've got over a thousand hosts that we're actually interested in here. Let's see what the risk ratings look like. I can run those scan results through that group object commandlet looking at risk. And it looks like uh, about 149 of that 28,000 were critical, but 24,000 of those had a risk rating of none. Those are gonna be informational plugins from Nessus. Hey, I found the host. I was able to do a DNS lookup on it. Here are the ports that I found listening. Here are the versions of services that I found running. Most of those are not going to be super important to me. So we'll make a deal with management that we'll talk to them about these things, the things that are the non-none vulnerabilities. So one of the questions they asked me is, well, how bad is it? Which servers have the most vulnerabilities? So I'm gonna pull out just critical vulnerabilities here, group them up by the host, and then ask it to show me a list of all of the hosts that have more than five critical vulnerabilities. So if I were just weighting this based on how many CVEs did we see on a system, I'm probably gonna ask the engineers to start working on that machine before they do any of the others. But this at least gives them a little bit of a way that they can kind of triage these results. So remember, we had 149 critical vulnerabilities here. Management has asked us, well, what percentage of our vulnerabilities are labeled as critical? So I'm gonna grab that critical count into a variable. I'm also gonna grab just a total count of vulnerabilities that are scored something other than none into another variable. So now I've got two variables called critical count and total count that have some numeric values in them, 149 and 5,224. If I remember from junior high math correctly, to get a percentage there, I can just divide one by the other. And it looks like about 3% of my vulnerabilities are critical. Now the command I'm running right now groups vulnerabilities by host and by risk level. So in this scan, we had three medium vulnerabilities for this particular host. What if I were to gather that data every night after I run my vulnerability scan so that I could track this over time in something like a dashboard? Well, that's actually what the administrators have been doing now for the last 90 days in our environment. So I'm gonna ask them to give me a dump of all of these scan results for all of the servers over the last 90 days. It'll take them a minute to come back with the results for this, but when they do, I'm gonna have a file called vulndata.csv that has all of that information in it. So they've used the API in Nessus to export a CSV every night. They've processed that data into a great big CSV that gives me a server name, a date, the risk rating, and how many vulnerabilities they had with that particular risk rating. And they've done that for 50 servers over the last 90 days. Well, I'm gonna grab that result into a variable here, just called results. And it looks like I've got about 27,000 entries in that variable. That's going to be 50 servers over 90 days with five different criticality levels for each day. Now, I'm gonna process that into a format that works with my 
graphite database that I use in my dashboard. And don't worry, we're going to talk about graphite and Grafana next week when we do part three of the series. The way that Graphite likes to receive information is I've got a database name, I've got something like a server name here, and then I've got a metric. So if I want to know vulnerabilities for server zero that were scored as medium on a particular date, now that date is done in Unix epoch time, so that's the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970, then I had 25 vulnerabilities for that server. I'm just going to import that into the graphite database that I've got sitting behind my dashboard here. And again, this is going to take just a second to load because I am putting 27,000 entries into the database, but it looks like it's finished for me now. So I've started creating a dashboard here in Grafana, and I'm going to say, let me see if I can make this just a little bit bigger for you and I'll make sure that you don't miss any of the screen. So I'll just kind of resize it like that. I'm gonna say here, I would like to look at vulnerabilities. Let's just do it for all servers. Let's do it just for critical vulnerabilities right now. And I would actually like you to just add those up for me and give me a total across all of my servers. Make that graph a little bigger and track this out over the last 90 days since that's what you have collected for me. And in this case, I'm actually seeing an organization that seems to be doing a pretty good job of managing vulnerabilities. When they ran their first block of scans, they had a total of around 300 critical vulnerabilities. And as they've worked on remediating those, it's gotten continually better over time. Now, don't let the little spikes bother you here. In fact, when you start doing graphing like this, you're gonna learn that you can identify Patch Tuesday in a Windows environment just by looking for these spikes. What's happened is, even though we've been doing remediation, the bad guys have been figuring out new vulnerabilities and eventually that shows up in my phone scanner and I'll see the occasional spike. In fact, you may see it even a little bit more pronounced as you work with individual servers. We were doing pretty well. In fact, we had gotten this one down to zero critical vulnerabilities, and then darn it, some new critical vulnerability got discovered, and it took us a few days to get that patched. This is the sort of result that I would expect to see in a mature organization once they begin doing vulnerability scanning. If the trend is downward over time, we might even flirt with zero for things like critical vulnerabilities, but what I'm really looking for is this very low, long tail on this graph showing me that we've done a pretty good job of controlling existing vulnerabilities over time. That puts me pretty close to where I would like to be to finish the demos for the webcast today. So I know we've had a number of questions come in today, Carol. So we've got, it looks like uh, seven or eight minutes left here that we can use to try to answer a few of those. So what kind of questions do you have for me? All right, yes, thanks for that great presentation. Let's see here. Um, <laughs> I think there's a couple of comments that I'll send your way. Um, okay. At the end of the webcast, let's see here. You mentioned the standard in reference to, I guess, PuTTY version. Uh, there's some capital letters, <laughs> capital P-U, capital yeah. T-T-Y version number. Is the standard determined by the CIS benchmarks? So this feels like one that I want to have the camera on for. I'm not aware of a benchmark that would specify a particular version for something like PuTTY. So what CIS tells you to do is, hey, your organization is a special snowflake you need to determine what versions of the software you need to have running and then make sure that only those versions are running on your systems. So very rarely will CIS go so far as to tell you a particular version of something that you should be running. Just like NIST, they're gonna say you should do a risk analysis and make sure that you're running a well-patched product that supports your needs. Great, thanks. The next one says, what about, and in quotation marks, wing it, W-I-N-G-E-T? 
Um, I'm not actually even sure what that one is referring to, so I would need a little bit more context to uh, to be able to answer that. All right, we'll see if they, <clears throat> excuse me, if they add to it. All right, have you used ELK for visualizations? Is it worth going down that path? So I absolutely have, and this is something that I kind of deal with um, all the time. You can use, ELK is really more of a, of a SIEM product, and you can absolutely use ELK for that. In fact, Kibana is a really nice visualization tool, but it's really built to work with data in a slightly different format. And in fact, I'm gonna take a little liberty here and expand that question even farther. What about something like Power BI that's also built for, for doing dashboards? You can make most of those tools work pretty well for you. And if they already exist in your ecosystem and you're a compliance or a security person who's not really charged with creating new systems, it might be worth trying that. But if you're able to build this from scratch, Power BI is not a bad option. And uh, what I call the Gragra stack, Graphite and Grafana work pretty well. I actually use Graphite and Grafana in practice, but I use it in my SEC 557 class because I figure it's probably out there somewhere in use by your developers or your engineers already. And I really like to live off the land and not have to build my own tools. So Elk, absolutely, if it already exists, you can, you can probably twist things to work this way, but Graphite with Grafana as a front end is really built for time series data like we're doing here. And I find that that makes things work a little bit better for me. So something that's built just for time series data, you may get slightly better results. All right, thanks. Uh, back to that previous question, the person writes, sorry, the winget reference was in regards to the package manager instead of uh, CH. Gotcha, instead of chocolatey. Yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that is, yeah, I think that is winget. So I think that is the Windows uh, Windows Package Manager. Um, you are generally still going to see uninstall paths with any of the package managers that you use. And so that should work pretty well for you for doing the, the sort of version testing that we talked about earlier. Ultimately, the best way to answer this is to see if the executable that you're interested in, like my Firefox.exe in my example, has a version flag and go run that executable with the version flag, capture the output and use that for your compliance check. That's gonna be like the 100% foolproof way of doing this. But at scale, that gets a little bit difficult. So usually the second script that I showed you that, that iterates through the uninstall paths will work pretty safely with most package managers. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah. Someone says, thank yeah, you so much. One more. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll give you a comment. Someone says, thank you so much for the presentation. Have to drop off early. Still, you are the most knowledgeable auditor on the planet Earth, sir, on the planet Earth. <laughs> All right, so. Um, that is my new LinkedIn buddy. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll squeeze one more in and then of course send you the rest. Um, what dashboard again is currently being displayed? And this came in four minutes ago. So this is using Grafana. And Grafana is a tool that's pretty commonly used by DevOps teams these days. So in fact, I'll give you kind of the whole stack here. This is using Graphite as a time series database in the back end, and then it is using Grafana. Here, I'll take you guys back to the homepage here. That's the little logo that you're looking for for Grafana. This is a very heavily used dashboard in the development and site reliability engineering world. And it's one that you're likely to run into if you guys are doing DevOps or SRE. All right, thanks. I think we'll squeeze another one in. Um, and this one says, how do you spell graphite? So graphite is actually spelled like the, uh, like the, the carbon molecule. Let me just take you here to my data sources. Graphite is like that, like the word graph with I-T-E at the end. And that's a nice simple one to end on. Maybe we make that the last question. 
All right, sounds good. Well, thank you so much, Clay, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.